the Dynasty Slant, TFF's fantasy podcast focused on Dynasty and Keeper Leagues. I've got Michael Moore here, as always, joining me, Scott Spratt. And Michael, I'm really glad that we have a busy show planned for today, so I don't have to revel in the Panthers' loss to the Saints on Sunday. But do you want to try to console me real quick so I'm not just angry and bitter for the next 40 minutes? Uh, no. I kind of want to see angry and bitter Scott <laughs> for once. I want to see what All that right, looks well, then like. I, so. Then I'll be yelling into the microphone, so get yeah, ready, guys. Fun. Topic six. All right, so we have some really interesting topics this week. I wanted to try to focus everything I could on the teams that we just saw play over the weekend. So we've got eight teams that were really hitting heavily today. But again, this is just going to be Dynasty and Keeper League thoughts. And I think the place to start, Michael, is in Kansas City, where, again, they had another disappointing end to their season. And even though Alex Smith put up good numbers, he was 24 for 33 for 264 with two touchdowns and zero picks. The Chiefs blew that big lead, and I have to figure that he's going to be gone next season, if for no other reason than the team invested heavily in Pat Mahomes, and he seems like the natural place to replace him. So I guess my question for you, Michael, is can you handicap for me where you think Alex Smith is going to be playing next season? Yeah, and look, I think, you know, obviously Alex Smith is a bit older than the last time he got traded from San Francisco to Kansas City. He'll be 34 next year. Yeah, right. So it's not exactly uh, he's not exactly going to a rebuilding team. So I think you got to look for a team that's in definite win now mode. That is maybe just a quarterback or just a quarterback and a couple other pieces away from being a contender. And look, we discussed a couple of teams a couple of weeks ago. There's several teams that fit that mold. I think. Yeah, so a couple of weeks ago, like you mentioned, we were talking about Kirk Cousins and where he might land if he doesn't go back to Washington. And let me just kind of remind everybody my thoughts at the time were that there were 21 teams with quarterback situations that I thought were pretty fixed. And then there are 11 teams where it's a bit more uncertainty. For those, you have the Cardinals with Carson Palmer now retiring officially, the Bills, the Bengals, the Browns, the Broncos, the Jaguars, the Dolphins, the Vikings, the Giants, the Jets, and the Redskins. We've had a little bit more clarity in a couple of those cases, especially with the draft pick side of things. The Browns have the number one and number four picks. The Broncos have the number five pick, and the Giants have the number two pick in particular. So I think that means that they may be looking to draft a quarterback. Um, But I mean, just looking at Smith as a player, there's some interesting things about him that I think might fit him in with certain teams more than others. I kind of actually drew this as a comparison to Kirk Cousins especially because if they're both going to be available, maybe they're going to be the premier names you can sort of add in free agency. They've actually been pretty similar in recent seasons. Over the last three years, Smith has been 7.5 yards per attempt and Cousins 7.8. But the real differences are stylistic. Cousins has been way more willing to throw the ball down the field at 8.1 yard average depth of throw compared to 6.7 for Smith. And Smith has been incredible at holding one to the ball and not committing turnovers. He has just 20 interceptions and seven fumbles over the last three years. That's 1.6 interceptions plus fumbles per drop back, which is the best in the league. You've got Smith at 1.6 there, then Tyrod Taylor at 1.8, Tom Brady at 1.9, and then guys like Aaron Rodgers and Andy Dalton at 2.2. So Smith is really good at holding one of the ball. You mentioned that he's older and a veteran. He seems like a perfect guy to add to a veteran team that's sort of defense-focused. Is that sort of where your mind is, Michael? Yeah, and I know uh, you've got some teams that you think, and and why don't we just go down the list, and I can tell you which teams we agree on. How about that? Okay, do you want me to go with the guy, the teams that I sort of bolded as being my favorite yes. fits? Yes, so okay. let's go down the list. So the Cardinals, we both Cardinals, agree. Cardinals, yes. Yeah, we both agree on that. I think they've got a team that's ready to win now. I think, look, they just signed Fitz to sort of a quasi-extension, so he wants to stay. Um, they've got David Johnson, who, you know, even though he hasn't played that long, is not exactly a young running back. They've got a defense that's getting older. So, yes, we agree on that. The Bills, though, you you seem to think that they might be a good fit. I disagree with that. So why don't you tell me why you think that's a fit first? OK, the reason I think it's a fit, let's, let's take Tyrod out of it for a second. I, I feel like they are a defense focused team that likes to run the ball and wants to play that like kind of old school mentality of taking care of the ball, limiting possessions, playing defense, winning games with low scores. 
they don't really have a lot of offensive talent other than LaShawn McCoy to really stretch the field. They've got the bad weather to deal with up and up Buffalo. So I think having a guy that can take care of the ball and let their defense win the games would be a good fit. See, and I just disagree with that. I guess because I think they're going to be headed more towards the rebuild mode now. Meaning, okay. and look, we're going to get to McCoy here in a little bit. He's going to get older. I don't know that they necessarily, I don't think he's 100% to come back. Um, obviously, they are going to move on from Tyrod. Uh, I think everything they've done the last year or so has been built towards rebuilding. Even what they did last year with trading with the actually Kansas City Chiefs as far as trading up for Pat Mahomes. They traded out of the first round last year to get another pick this year. So for me, I think they are going to start rebuilding. And look, if anything... I tend to think this playoff appearance maybe bought themselves some time on that, meaning if they didn't make the playoffs and it extended their non-playoff streak, there might have been more more urgency to make the playoffs. But now it's like, hey, we made the playoffs last year, so they can tell the fan base just wait a little bit. We know what we're doing. So I think you and I disagree on that. Uh, Yeah, I don't want to sidetrack this into a Bills-related question or podcast, (laughs) but like, why can't they just keep trying to win and rebuilding at the same time. Like if they were had this much success this season, if that's a formula that works for them, why not bring in Smith while they try to develop a younger quarterback too? Well, not everyone can be the Dodgers of football, Scott, and win and then <laughs> rebuild at the same time. So I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, the Bills don't have a $300 million payroll, so you're right. Not, not yet. Uh, let's, keep, let's keep going with more teams. My next bolded team was the Denver Broncos. See, I don't agree with that either. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> well, I t- to me, I just think they go. I think they go with a quarterback with that top pick, personally. And look, I think they're close to rebuild mode too. I mean, their receivers are fairly old. They do have some young players on offense, though. But I, I for whatever reason, I just got a feeling Elway is going to hit the reset button on that and get a quarterback with that fifth pick. I don't think he trades that or any other pick for Alex Smith. I think they go younger with that. I don't think you would need to. But anyway. I think we'll probably both agree that the Jaguars would be a great place for Smith, oh, right? that would probably be my top choice, yeah. Okay, good. What about the Vikings? Now, I still think Case Keenum is where they want to look, but again, all of their quarterbacks are free agents, so they may not be able to get it even if they want them. Uh, I, yes, I agree with you there, definitely. And look, I think it, it wouldn't be unreasonable for the Vikings to just go, you know what? Forget all three quarterbacks we have on the roster right now. We're just going to start over with Alex Smith and go for it. I could completely see that happening. Here's my dark horse, and I kind of like it, is the Washington Redskins. I sneaky think that Smith might be a better fit for their roster than even Cousins because of how, I guess, sneaky good their defense was this season. Do you like that at all? Uh, Well, and again, everything is tied to Cousins. So if Cousins leaves, absolutely. But I, I guess the one concern I'd have, I don't know that I necessarily agree that he'd be a great fit, only because I don't know what the running game there looks like. I mean, yes, you've got Chris Thompson, but... They are just like adamant that he's not going to be a three down back like Kareem Hunt was at times this season, which really helped out, obviously, Alex Smith. Now, if Jordan Reed ever got fully healthy, do they have their Travis Kelsey? Yeah. And do they have some good young receivers? Yeah. But um, to me, it still goes back to Cousins. If they don't re-sign Cousins, yes, I could see that, and I agree with you. You might be able to get Smith for a very short-term, inexpensive deal while Cousins is getting paid $100 million. And not that that isn't justifiable. But. Yeah, and I, I have no doubt that he's going to cost way less than Cousins is. I mean, Cousin is not – he's not going to play without a long-term deal. He's gone two seasons without a long-term deal when he re- very rightly could have. So, yeah, I agree. He'll be a lot cheaper. I just, I just don't know how successful that will be. Well, those are my teams. Do you have any more that you think Smith would be a, a really nice fit for? The only one I could see, and I guess I'd have to get your thoughts on the Giants and their cap situation because – it looks like they could save some money by cutting Eli next year, can't they? Well, I think they he, he would be dead to a certain extent, but I think they could probably trade him. Um, so I think they could probably get out of Manning if they really wanted to. But does that make the team better? I think it would be very, very fun from a real-life and fantasy perspective if, say, they drafted Saquon Barkley and then signed Alex Smith. A Smith... Barkley, Odell Beckham triumvirate would be very intriguing to me, and that would be better. Now, it, it again, it's kind of like with Washington. Who knows what they're going to do with Eli? I kind of think they got to stick with Eli now after they completely muffed what they wanted to do this season. But uh, that was the only other team that I could see him going that you didn't have on there. So for the most part, we agree on this. 
but so I can get yelled at on Twitter. Uh, why, like, why are the Bills in rebuild mode, but the Giants aren't? The Giants have way less talent on their roster than the Bills do. I guess we'd have to agree if they're more, well, on defense, they're more talented. I'll give you that. But on offense, you've got an Odell Beckham who's still pretty young. They don't need to start over on offense. Not much, at least not to me. They need, I mean, look, it's a possible, it's a possibility with Smith. It just depends on Eli at this point and what they do at running back. I mean, they could sign Carlos Hyde too. That can make them better. And I, I agree. It may not be much of a difference with Eli and Alex Smith. It could be cheaper though. I don't know. I'll say good luck to the Giants if that's their plan, but I think we'll both <laughs> we I think we probably both agree they're looking quarterback with their early picks. So we can sort of wait and see what happens there. All right, let's move on to the second topic, which is related to Derrick Henry, a guy that we talked about in Gunpoint Banner a few weeks ago, is one of the backs to own um, for one of the guys that wasn't a starter yet this season. Well, he finally got a chance to start over the last couple of games, and in the playoff game, he was pretty tremendous. Um, so I think at that point, the question sort of becomes, he, he seems to be taking over that role. Um, how does he look to you? Let, let's look at this sort of from a redraft league perspective entering 2018. Where do you sort of see him there? Is he a top 10 back in your mind yet? Top 10 back or top 10 overall? Back, not okay. overall. Back, definitely. I think he's absolutely going to be a running back one. I think at the least he's a low-end running back one with the possibility of being a top five guy, depending on the workload they give him. I mean, he averaged uh, – I will say I am very, I guess, pleased with how they handled him, especially after his 400 carry last season in Alabama, which was just nuts. They didn't ride him very hard. They bought some time with him, sort of let him, I guess, you know, regroup or refresh his legs. So I think this is probably the year they cut DeMarco. They can save six and a half million doing that. And look, he's Henry has proven that he can handle more of a load this year. He had 176 carries compared to 110 last year and still be effective. So I don't see any reason why they keep DeMarco and not turn the keys over to Henry. And if they do, uh, I think he's definitely a running back one next year. So, I mean, I definitely like him, Henry. I'm not sure he's quite a running back one for me, but there's a lot about him that I do like. In particular, that um, 3.2 yards after contact per attempt, which was top five in the league among backs with 100 carries this season. He was very effective, actually had quite a number of carries, 176, 4.2 yards per attempt overall. But the one thing that I noticed was that among the guys in the top 10 or so, top 10 or 15, he was near the bottom of those guys in tackles avoided per attempt or tackles avoided per 100 attempts is kind of the stat that I pulled here. Uh, he was just avoiding, where do I have him here? Here we go, 14.8 tackles avoided per 100 attempts. A lot of the leaders on that list were in the high teens, if not the low 20s. It's not like that's surprising. Henry is obviously a huge guy. And he's going to be going through defensive players rather than running around them. But it does kind of speak to the type of player that tends to be given specialized roles, that like early down coverage. Do you think he's going to be moving into getting third down work? Or do you think there's just going to be so much early down work and so much potential goal line work that it's going to make up for it and make him that top 10 player? Yeah, more the latter. Uh, I think to your point, I don't know that they are going to rely on him for that three-down role. And look, they certainly haven't used him in conjunction with DeMarco that way, meaning even though he was sort of spelling DeMarco, it's not like they tried to get him on the field for passing downs. He still hasn't had more than 13 receptions in either one of his two seasons. So it's not like they were even grooming him for that kind of role either. So I think he's going to stick to the first and second down role. I just think he's going to dominate that role and, like you said, get a lot more goal line touches than he probably uh, did these first two seasons. I mean, both of those things I agree are true, but I'm not sure how that adds up to being a top 10 or, you know, top five chance running back. Let me read you off Jeff's early 2018 running back redraft rankings and then see where you think he stacks up. Do you like Henry more than Le'Veon Bell next year? No, I like Le'Veon Bell. Todd Gurley? Nope. David Johnson? Nope. Ezekiel Elliott? Ooh, that's getting closer, but I would still take Elliott. Not sure how that's close, but okay. Kareem Hunt? <laughs> Uh, Kareem Hunt Alvin Kamara Alvin Kamara Leonard Fournette See, now this is getting close uh, I would probably take Oof You know what? I would probably take Derrick Henry between these two I would definitely take Fournette What about Melvin <laughs> Gordon? Uh, oh, I would take I think And again, this is all assuming Derrick Henry is the starter next year But I would take Derrick yeah, Henry Yeah, we're or, assuming that Yeah, I would take Derrick Henry Gordon all day. Dalvin <laughs> Cook. 
I love how much we're agreeing on this episode, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I told I can, you I was salty. I, 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 I warned you. I, I warned def- you of this. I would definitely sense the uh, the bitterness. Uh, yeah. Dalvin Cook, I would take Dalvin Cook, actually, over Derrick Henry. Okay, and then Devontae Freeman. Uh, you know what? I would probably take Derrick Henry, and it's not because I think Henry's the better player. I just like his situation, I think, more than Freeman. I think I think Coleman makes a bigger takes a bigger role next year, personally. Okay. I think, I mean... That's that's fair. You did put him in the top ten. It looked like he was ninth in your list. Um, he's just a little bit lower for me. I just I feel like he like I don't know. I feel like he's an Alex Collins type of role from this season. Mm-hmm. I do think Collins' role may expand next season. But that's kind of what I see for for Henry, and I think that does have some limitations to his upside. Still a really valuable player. Still probably a top ten dynasty running back because of the youth too. But. I'm just not sure he's going to be getting like 250 combined touches, I hmm. guess we should say. Interesting. So, okay. Uh, let's kind of see. We're going to probably come back to that to see if Tennessee does anything in the offseason, maybe brings in a complimentary player and what that might mean. Well, yeah, and I was just going to say, that'll be the big question. If they do move on from DeMarco, that obviously frees up some space. And look, they could even get a guy in the draft, too. This draft is loaded with running backs. So I think they definitely bring someone in. It's just a matter of who they bring in and what kind of role are they going to True. Okay, let's move on to the third topic, which is Robert Woods. Like Henry, he had a monster wildcard game with nine catches, 142 yards, no touchdowns, but that was on 14 targets. He actually had more than half of the Rams' total passing production, so it's pretty crazy. And he had a really good year overall, too, which we'll break into for a second. But, Michael, what are your thoughts on Woods and what his value for 2018 is going to be and long-term value as well? Uh, you know, I think it's... I think it's I think it's heavily tied to if Sammy Watkins comes back, personally. I think if Sammy Watkins comes back, it's going to obviously limit it. And I looked at what Sean McVay-led teams, offenses, did as far as its top three receivers go. McVay's best season as far as receiver output was 2016 with the Redskins. You had Pierre Garçon with 1,041 yards, Deshaun Jackson with 1,005, and Jamison Crowder with 847. Okay, so that's the max. So we can't take any receiver on a McVay-led offense and give him any more than that, even on his best season. So with Woods, I think the absolute ceiling is going to be barely eclipsed at 1,000 yards, and that's without a Sammy Watkins around. So, look, I think he's got value. I think he's definitely got some uh, some scoring ability, too. I just don't see him ever being a bona fide wide receiver one or even a wide receiver two at this point. Okay, I agree with you that there's a limited ceiling, but let me throw a couple of devil's advocate points at you. The first is that Woods averaged 9.9 yards per target this season. That was tied for 10th among wide receivers with at least 50-plus targets, and obviously, therefore, the highest on the Rams. He was also top 20 in fantasy points per game. He actually missed a couple of weeks, which is why I didn't do the full season here, but he was just below Jarvis Landry and Doug Baldwin and just above Mike Evans and Robbie Anderson, I think maybe 17th in standard scoring uh, per game. So he kind of showed those skills before. Hearing that, does that sort of change your perspective at all? Do you think that he could maybe be the clear best Ram receiver? Oh, I think that's possible. I think, you know, but again, it's not going to be, he's not going to be seeing the same volume as some of these elite receivers are. And I don't even know what kind of volume he's going to see, period. I mean, they've got Cooper Cup, who actually led the team this year in receiving yards. So to me, Cup is still going to be personally the guy to own as far as receivers go. But again, Woods is still going to be valuable. I mean, I, I just don't, I, to me, he's a much safer, he's on that wide receiver 2-3 line and maybe even flex rather than counting on him as a starter for my fantasy team, I guess. The trick is that both Woods and Cup are kind of low-depth target guys. Right. I think Woods Woods' average depth of target for the season was 10.9, so... Even if Watkins leaves, I kind of wonder whether those two are just going to be eating into each other's work. Like, I'm not sure if if Watkins leaving opens up new opportunities for them. And it's weird. Like, I know Watkins didn't have much of a fantasy season this season, but I've been working on this expected yardage model. And it's like it brings in all kinds of factors, like how far were the throws down the field, um, like how close were teams to the end zone, all kinds of things like that that affect how many yards you would expect a receiver to gain. And when I run that for the Rams receivers – Watkins and Cup both definitely outperformed Woods, which makes me think that maybe Woods had just had easier targets than those other guys, which kind of led to that fantasy production. I'm not sure if that's the kind of thing they would continue. And I kind of feel like Watkins is the guy that I'm going to want to own in this bunch next season. It's interesting because it, 
you know, not that, you know, look, it'd be really cool if the Rams like looked at your model, but <laughs> they could not care less. I'm not going to say he's replaceable, but for example, if they did cut Robert Woods, which is, I'm not advocating and I'm not saying it's going to happen, but they save $5 million, which is pretty, you know, that's a pretty good savings for a guy, especially if it's a receiver that you feel like you could easily replace. So my question to you, just Robert Woods, the player, is he sort of league average or do you keep him at sort of that elevated salary? I would keep him. I mean, they signed him to a five-year deal before this year and he had his best year of his career. So I feel like they have to be happy with what they saw. Good. And I, I, think he's, I think he's really good at his role. I just don't know whether that role can expand greatly even if they lose other pieces on the team. So do you consider him... Let's say all three come back, Watkins, Cup, and Woods. Who is number one when it comes to, I guess, targets? Who's go- who are they going to defer to? I think they could all finish within like 15 targets of each other, honestly. All right. Well, I'll, say, I'll say Watkins is going to be the number one in targets next year. So here's where I'm going with this. So with besides that 2016 season with McVay, the next best second receiver finished with 788 yards on a Sean McVay offense. And that was this year. So, and that was this year. And that was Todd Gurley. Todd Gurley was yeah. second in receiving <laughs> yards on the Rams. Robert Woods wasn't even second on his own team. So, my point well, is, he missed he missed three game, three or four games. Is, is kind of uh, you know he would have been uh, maybe. I, who knows? I mean, look, it, it seems like they rotated who they deferred to on these games. But the point is, I think we're in agreement. The upside is pretty limited there. It's got some value, and I think it's a pretty high floor. I just think the ceiling's limited there. Okay, in Jeff's 2018 wide receiver early rankings, he has Woods at 33. Let me read off some guys to you starting from 21, just to kind of give you a sense of this. Tell me if you want Woods over these guys. Number 21 is Larry Fitzgerald, assuming he returns. I would want Larry Fitzgerald. Okay, I assume so. Stephon Diggs? Diggs. Michael Crabtree? Ooh. That one's kind of up in the air. I feel like we need to see where he goes. Let's skip him. Demarius Thomas? Ah, ooh. Ah, you know, I'm going to have faith that they upgrade the quarterback position, uh, so I will go to Marius Thomas there. Fair. Jordy Nelson? Ooh. I'm going to ask you who you would take first. Of those two? Jordy. Yeah, I would yeah, take Jordy, definitely. too. Yeah. All right. Both Lions, Golden Tate and Marvin Jones. Ooh. I would take both Lions, I think. Yeah, me too. Juju Smith-Schuster? Oh, Juju. Give him the Juju. Agreed. Okay, Jeff has Sammy Watkins then at 30th, three spots ahead of Woods, number one on the Rams receivers. Oh, see, that's where I, I could diverge. I mean, I'm, I'm a real proponent that if Sammy goes to another team that makes him the primary, the primary target, that that 30th is justified. If he stays on the Rams, I don't know how that's justified. I would probably take Woods over Watkins at that point. Okay. I'm going to write an article about this. I think this is pretty interesting. So we can, we can talk about it more then. Uh, Woods or number 31, Devin Funchess. Uh, I would take Woods actually at that point. And then Jeff's last guy he has ahead of Woods is Josh Dotson of the Redskins. You know what? I, I really like Josh Dotson, but I would probably take Woods at this point. Okay. But I think even at that point, even with a couple of those guys that you might prefer Woods ahead of, we're talking about around the 30th, uh, number uh, receiver, and that's in standard scoring for next season. Woods' long-term value is going to be under some of the guys behind him, like Corey Davis, too, just because he's older and doesn't have that upside like some of those other guys do. So, you know, useful fantasy player, but maybe temper expectations a little bit, even though he might have looked like the best receiver on the team in the wildcard round. All right, moving on to the next topic, Julio Jones. Michael, are you worried at all about Jones' lack of touchdown production the last two seasons? And what do you think that does to his redraft ranking for next season and his long-term value as well? Uh, No, it doesn't worry me one bit. You know, it's the fact that he could have done so much more. Not necessarily that he disappointed, just that he was in a position to do more than he did. But look, he still finished fifth in standard scoring, even with the three touchdowns. You know, I mean, and no matter how many touchdowns he scored the last couple years, he finished fifth, sixth last year, second the year before, and eighth the year before that. So touchdown or not, he's just a target machine, and he he just produces receptions and yards like no other. I guess the question is, does a top five overall type of pick deserve to be held to a higher standard than that? Because he has six, eight, six, and this year three touchdowns the last four seasons. That's 
that's not a lot. You know, guys like Antonio Brown, who you don't necessarily think of as being red zone targets, he's getting like more than eight touchdowns every year. A lot of those guys are. Jones, for whatever reason, it just hasn't worked out yet. But the thing that I thought was super interesting about this when I was digging into the stats is that Jones had the opportunity for so many more touchdowns. You were just kind of talking about that. The previous three seasons before this season, uh, Jones had 16, 14, and 8 targets inside the five-yard line. And this season, he had 26. In the end zone, he went 8, 5, 6, and then last year, this year, 16. So actually, with Starkeesian as their offensive coordinator, they looked Jones' way a lot, lot more in the end zone and in the red zone than they previously had. That only manifested in five or in three touchdowns this season. But I think that's a total fluke. You know, with those targets inside the five-yard line, Jones was actually second in all of football among receivers at 26. DeAndre Hopkins was at 27, and he had 13 total touchdowns. You take all the guys that had at least 20 targets inside the five-yard line, they averaged eight uh, and a quarter touchdowns this season. So I don't know. I think Jones is going to score at least eight next year. It could be even more. He's still my number two wide receiver in redraft for next season. Are you, are you think I'm crazy with that? Well, who's your number one? <laughs> Antonio Brown. So not Odell Beckham, not one or two. Not in redraft, no. Interesting. Okay. I mean, I you know, I think you're splitting hairs uh, when we get to the top receivers between guys like Brown and Julio and Odell and even DeAndre Hopkins. I think, I think a case could be made for all four of those guys to be the top uh, redraft receiver, quite honestly. So, no, I don't think you're crazy. And look, if anything, Julio has proved to be at least the most durable of those uh, between, you know, after Antonio Brown, that is. So, no, I don't think that's crazy. I think it's, I think it's the, the difference is negligible between those four guys. I actually think that's a bolder opinion than you think, though, Michael. Like I, so Jeff has Antonio Brown, Odell Beckham, DeAndre Hopkins, Julio Jones as his top four. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people that have owned Jones and see the lack of touchdowns think that, like, Jones can't possibly be ahead of those other, any of those other three guys. And like hmm. Michael Thomas is fifth in Jeff's rankings. I think people would think it's crazy that Jones might go in front of him. I don't think they're right. I think you're right. But I, I do think that that's kind of a bold opinion. Well, and again, to, to your point, you know, with, with only scoring three touchdowns, he's back to my point, actually, he was still fifth, meaning, it, and like you said, he was in a good position to score a lot more. So it's not like, oh, he had a disappointing season for Julio. He just had a disappointing season because he could have had, he could have been an elite receiver. I mean, he was just very, very good this year as far as touchdowns go. So I don't know. I think they're all, I, I would be very happy if any one of them were my receiver and they were the first off the board. I agree. I'm pretty confident I'm going to get Julio in a lot of teams next season as other teams pass him by. So I guess we will see. But that raises an interesting question then. So where do you, where are you comfortable taking him in a redraft? Like, let's say, like what pick in round one or round two do you think he goes and what round or what pick do you think you have to take him before he gets taken by someone else? I don't think Julio is going to be one of the top 10 picks in most drafts next season. He would be for me. Again, I mentioned he's my second receiver. I'm going to have to sort of off the cuff think about which running backs that I would want ahead of him. I frequently lean a little bit more toward receiver early than a lot of guys anyway. But there are probably at least four or five running backs I would take before him, uh, just given like standard roster construction there. But yeah, I would take him like sixth or seventh, no problem. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think, I mean, again, with those four receivers, any one of them is an elite option. And depending on how you feel about the running backs that are left, they're probably more reliable too. So yeah, I can't fault you for that. All right. Speaking of running backs, let's move on to the fifth topic, which is LaShawn McCoy. He was really impressive in that Bills Jaguars game. I think that was a bit of a surprise for us. I mean, we had seen his ankle injury the previous week. He had to be carted off the field. And even after that, he came back, had this very nice performance. And he is that Bills team. I mean, you could see that he was really their one offensive player that was making plays on the field. But that kind of brings the question, like, how long can McCoy continue to be the Bills and continue to be such an effective running back? He's getting up there. He's going to be 30 years old next season. Do you think that curse of the age 30 season is going to hit McCoy, or does he have more years left in the tank, Michael? Well, look, nobody beats father time, so it's going to happen at some point. Now, I think the one thing that would worry me, and you can argue if it was injuries or not, but his yards per carry this year was the lowest it literally has ever been in his career. Uh, now, I couple that with he had the most carries he's had since 2014. So it's not like the Bills were afraid or scared to give him the ball, but he just wasn't as effective on a per-carry basis as he used to be. So 
You know, I, I think if I were a dynasty owner of McCoy, I think I would probably take this opportunity to get out before the cliff or before he fell off the cliff completely. And actually I did. I had McCoy in a dynasty league <laughs> this season. And I think I traded him for uh, a couple rookie picks, if I recall correctly. So uh, personally, I would get out for McCoy while there's still value there. Cause I don't know that he could stay as effective for much longer. So the reason I think that McCoy lost some of his, his yards per carry average this season, I think it actually was a decline in skill. And the thing that I point to is his elusiveness, which I'm going to measure by tackles avoided per 100 carries. Since 2011, he's been really good in that metric. Obviously, he's super dangerous in space. And on carries, he's gone 17.6 tackles avoided per 100 back in 2011, 19.5, 17.3, 12.5 being his low there at 2014, 16.7, 18.4 back in 2016, and then this year, just 11.1. So if you just kind of bunch it all together, from 2011 to 2016, McCoy avoided 16.8 tackles for every 100 rush attempts, this season, 11.1. I know it's kind of a noisy stat. It could be blippy. Who knows exactly why that happened? But I think that's kind of pointing to a potential decline in the skill of McCoy um, as he's getting up there. And, I mean, who can who can blame the poor guy? I mean, since 2009 when he came into the league, he's got over 2,000 carries. He's got over 400 receptions. In total, 26-24 total touches. That's the most in football over that stretch. And then besides Frank Gore and Matt Forte, nobody else has even 2,200 to- total touches over that time. So that's a full season extra, basically, over the rest of the field. So I don't know. I mean, I feel like McCoy's been worked really hard over his career. And for a guy that needs that sort of quick movement and elusiveness in open space to be effective, I would say that next year could really be his last very productive season in fantasy. Well, yeah, and to your point, he he was actually used more this season than he has been in quite some time and played a full 16 games for the first time yeah. in three years. So yeah. you've got the decline in skill plus the uh, added workload that he had this season. It just doesn't usually end well when those two things are mixed together. So I, I agree. I, I would be looking to move on from McCoy if I, if I could. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think he's probably usable as an RB2 next season in redraft formats, but in Dynasty, the the long-term value just isn't there anymore. All right, one last topic for the day. Um, This one breaks my heart a little bit, but maybe we can (laughs) go to spin it forward a bit. But Cam Newton, I thought, was really, really good in that playoff loss. Um, It was maybe his most accurate passing game of the season so far. And I kind of wanted to talk about where you see him as a Dynasty quarterback, because, you know, he... I think is often sort of derided as a bad thrower, but has been a much more productive fantasy player than potentially even a real life player in recent seasons. How do you view him versus some other quarterbacks in dynasty formats? Well, uh, I uh, recently updated my very own dynasty ranking, Scott, and I, I still have him as a top five guy. I mean, I, I think he rebounded very nicely. I mean, last year he was battling that, that injury, um, which yeah, obviously sapped uh, a big, yeah, a big part of his game, which was the running game. But look, he came back in full force with that this year. He had literally a career high in rushing yards this year with 754, um, yeah. along with six rushing touchdowns. And even in the passing game, and given he's not known for his passing, and I don't know that he ever will be, but he still had the third most passing touchdowns in a season that he's had over his career. So, look, he was still very good, and I think he, you know, I mean. To, to sort of uh, rip off a meme, he silenced the haters a little bit this season because he was very good. And look, the team itself was very good. And as Cam goes, the team's going to go. So to me, I mean, he's still young for a quarterback anyway. He's 28. He'll be 29 next year. Um, and as long as he's still proving that that running game uh, is a big part of, of what he can do and he still can do it, he's going to be a top five guy for me. If you're willing to throw out 2016 because of his his ankle injury that that did really influence his ability to run the football, his other six seasons, he's averaged 660 rushing yards and 8.2 rushing touchdowns per season. I think the initial fear with Newton was that the high rushing touchdown production that he had in his first two seasons, 14 and 8, that just wasn't really sustainable, but he kind of has sustained it in the years since then. And because of that, uh, he's finished as a top four fantasy quarterback in standard scoring in four of his or in five of his seven seasons so far in his career. So he's been very productive today. You're right. I want to go kind of hit on your ranking specifically. I think we can both agree that Newton belongs behind Rodgers, um, Deshaun Watson, Carson Wentz, and Russell Wilson in some order. I- I'm with mm-hmm. you there. 
the guys that you have uh, Newton ahead of that Scott Barrett doesn't in his dynasty rankings, I want to go through those guys one at a time. His first is Andrew Luck, who you mentioned a couple of weeks ago. What are your thoughts on Luck at this point? Well, and first off, I may have been a little rash a couple of weeks ago, Scott, as far as, yeah. as him being borderline quarterback one as far as dynasty goes. Now, I you still have a bit, Luck yeah. ranked. I did, and I, but I still have him ranked lower than I think a lot of dynasty rankers would because for me, I still I, I want to see that he's healthy. I, I mean, he didn't play all of 2017, and there's still a, a big question mark on if he's going to play next year and what that's going to look like. So to yeah. me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put him at least – I wouldn't put him in the second, third spot like he has been. Um, six again is is the the height for me, but there's just too many questions marked with his health. Question marks with his health that is for me to put him any higher than that. Okay, I think that's fair. Now, why do you think Cam is better than than Dak Prescott and Marcus Mariota, two similar players who were several years younger? Well, I think Cam has an edge on them in the rushing game, and yes, Cam is older than them. I mean, Dak's going to be 25 next season. Uh, Cam's going to be 29, so he's got four seasons, but. To me, Cam uses the run game much more than Dak does at this point. And I, you know, like as far as the passing game goes, I think they're probably about even for as much as for as how they use it and how effective they are. Uh, but it's really the running game. I really think the Panthers rely on that from Cam a lot more and give him more opportunities for that than they do with Dak Prescott. Now with Mariota, you know, I think his play declined so much from the first year to the second year that I'm concerned that. I'd be concerned that Mariota isn't as good as we all hoped he would be uh, his after his sophomore season. I mean, he played a full season this year, but he threw 13 touchdowns and 15 interceptions, which isn't great. And again, with yeah, the running game, great. Cam Cam ran ran a lot better and a lot more, quite honestly, than Mariota did. So it, that would just uh, well, actually, he didn't even run more; he ran the same. It was just Cam was much more effective at it than Mariota was. So uh, I there again, I think Cam is just more effective rushing the ball than those two are. Then you got two more guys in Scott Barrett's rankings before Cam, which are Kirk Cousins and Jameis Winston. What are your thoughts there? Well, and look, and Kirk Cousins, I, I, I do, I think like, I, I like him as a dynasty prospect. The not knowing where he's going to be, I think, still gives me some concern. Meaning, it could be a completely different situation he's in next year. I mean, hypothetically, you go to Jacksonville and not be asked to pass the ball as much as he is in Washington. So who knows what his fantasy production is going to be. Uh, and then with Winston, man, I think I, I can't claim this comparison, but somebody compared Jameis Winston to Jay Cutler as far as quarterbacks go. Wow. And if that's the yeah. case, I, I would, I would not be a fan of having Winston on my dad. That's interesting. I think with, that's really interesting. I think, with, I think with that too, Winston is just, it's too much of a wild card on how how effective he's going to be. You know, he went from 22 touchdowns his rookie year up to 28 last year, down to 19 this year. Now he did miss three games with an injury, but Winston is completely tied to the passing game. There's not a lot of value in his running game, so he's going to be tied to the passing game. So in order to make up for that, he's got to throw 30 touchdowns consistently to be more valuable to me than Cam, and I don't see that happening on a consistent basis. So. For that reason, I would still stick with Cam as far as Dynasty ranks go. All right. That sounds good. Let's move on to some gunpoint banner. Um, guys? Gunpoint banter. All right. We can we consider bullying this out into one of the bigger topics, but I think this made a really interesting head-to-head question. We've had two head coaches named over the last couple of days. We've got John Gruden in Oakland making all the money, and then we've got Chiefs offensive coordinator Matt Nagy getting the head coaching job in Chicago. So, Michael, who do you think is going to have a more positive impact on their quarterback and that quarterback's fantasy prospects going forward? Well, look, I know for the money, uh, I think Oakland (laughs) prays that it's John Gruden, uh, but... Uh, I really, I really like what Chicago is going to do with Matt Nagy and with uh, Trubisky there. So uh, Nagy was the offensive coordinator, coordinator with the Chiefs this last season. Uh, he actually didn't get play calling duties until about the last month or so when Andy yeah, Reid sort of, I think. Yeah. yeah, when Andy Reid sort of shunned himself uh, from p- play calling duties. So over that last month or so. Uh, Kansas City actually averaged three more points on offense than they did the uh, the season be- for the season before that. They were averaging about 29 compared to about 26 uh, before Nagy took over. And as far as Alex Smith goes, over that, stre- that four-game stretch uh, that he started, he averaged 
going 22 of 34 for 64%, 292 yards a game, and he threw seven touchdowns over four games. So the yardage, as far as per game goes, was a little higher than what Smith did on the season, as was the uh, the completion percentage. So, you know, it wasn't much, but look, Alex Smith had his best season this season with Nagy as offensive coordinator. Uh, he doesn't have a long track record, Nagy that is, as far as offensive play calling, but he did wonders with Alex Smith and the Chiefs. He turned Kareem Hunt into a star, obviously. Um, so for that, I'm hopeful uh, that he can do more with Trubisky than Gruden's going to be able to do with Carr. Not to mention, just one other note, you've only yeah. had, what, three quarters of a season with Trubisky that he still may be moldable, right? Where you've got Carr, who's three seasons in, and I don't know this for sure, but he may not be as changeable as a Trubisky who's just starting out. So for those reasons, I would take Nagy and the Bears. I took kind of a longer view in, taking, in looking at this question um, because Nagy was actually the quarterback's coach and then this year, the offensive coordinator for all of Smith's run with Kansas City. So he was there for a longer period of time. And I actually think he did an ob- awesome job with Smith. I mean, he really highlighted the things that he was best at, and they sort of did that, made them a very effective team. But you still have to consider that over that run, Smith's average numbers for the Chiefs were 3,500 passing yards, 20 touchdowns, and seven interceptions per season. That's just 487 pass attempts per season, which is definitely on the low end of things these days. Smith's best year was this year, and that was 4,000 yards, 26 and 5 on 505 attempts. That's still a pretty conservative offense. I mean, you're kind of topping out as a back end quarterback one there. I don't know how much of that's Nagy, how much of it's Reed. I don't know. I would feel great about having him as my head coach, but like, is he going to turn Trubisky into a fantasy star? I'm not really sure I see that. Now, I'm not necessarily sure I see it with Gruden either, but. Gruden has that same advantage that Nagy's going to have coming off of John Fox, which is that Jack Del Rio has been a run-focused coach over the course of his career. I think both of those guys are going to have the opportunity to increase the number of pass attempts their quarterbacks see for game, which should be a a really good boost for each of their quarterbacks in fantasy perspective. But like, not even really looking at this from a data perspective, but um, Peter King interviewed Chris Sims, who used to quarterback for Gruden for a while in Tampa. Um, and, and basically, Sims say that, that Gruden is a really good micromanager of the game and is going to kind of be in there in the trenches with, with Carr, looking at film and everything along those lines, and that, that he thinks it would be a really good fit um, for Carr and sort of keeping him just kind of being there, being in the mix all the time, keeping him disciplined. And, and Carr is sort of a really big work ethic guy, so that might be a really nice fit. Obviously, I don't really have a lot of stats to sort of to, to hammer this point home, but Carr has showed a lot of fantasy potential previously. And... Like, I know Gruden's been out of the game for a long time, but I think just kind of moving off of where they were, this offense has a chance to sort of open it up from a passing perspective. And I think that could make him, Carr, kind of rejoin the top 10 among quarterbacks in fantasy. I guess we'll see, but that's kind of how I'm seeing things. Yeah, and, you know, there's going to be a lot of of decisions to be made there in Oakland. I mean, what do you do with Crabtree? Uh, What do they do in the running game? I mean, do they go back to Marshawn Lynch this season, or do they uh, bring in someone else? But... Yeah, there's just a lot of a lot of holes there, I guess. And with Chicago, I feel like there's not as many holes on offense, surprisingly. I mean, they've got, obviously, Trubisky. Uh, they've got the Jordan Howard-Tarek Cohen combo. I mean, sure, they need a couple more receiving options, but uh, somehow it's almost like Chicago has the pieces more settled than Oakland does at this point. So it'll be interesting to see what uh, what they both do. Yeah, I mean, I think both teams should probably be pretty optimistic about moving forward and and maybe turning in things a a little bit around next season. All right, Michael, let's do Stash of the Week before we head on out of here. I'm telling you, these shares are hot. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. It's definitely a good idea. Dwayne, 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 I get it. Now, can you get me? Have I ever lied to you? That's right. And ask around. I never do, Dwayne. Stash of the Week. I gave you a difficult assignment because I asked that we both pick stashes of the week from the eight teams that played in the wildcard round last weekend. So that really limited our options. But I expect you still did good, Michael. Who did you come up with for your stash this week? Well, I went with, uh, and it's kind of timely because we talked about uh, the Rams receivers a lot today. But I went with Josh Reynolds, uh, the rookie for the Rams. Well, not a rookie anymore, but he was yeah. drafted in the fourth round this year. Um, a big target. He's six three. Uh, 192. Uh, and to me, he seems like a, a good choice for the Rams to replace Sammy Watkins with if they move on from him, meaning he's a deep threat. He, uh, he finished in the top 20 of this rookie class in deep yards and deep receptions. Uh, and look, to your point, if they keep Woods and Cup sort of underneath, 
they can still use Reynolds over the top, and, and he can be pretty productive. So, you know, it, it's going to be a major decision what they do with Watkins, but if they move on, I see Reynolds as the guy to sort of take over that role. I actually also randomly picked a Ram, so that that's kind of fun. Um, I went with Gerald Everett, their rookie tight end this, from this last season. He didn't really do much in the playoff game, just one for four on two targets, but I think he has a lot of potential going forward. He was a second-round pick this season. He's 6'3", 239 pounds, so pretty big target. Um, kind of similar in size to Tyler Higby, who's another tight end on the roster that they had drafted the previous season. But I liked Everett over Higby as a talent. He was better than Higby in terms of uh, yards per target this season, 8.1 versus 7.0 for Higby. That actually made Everett the 14th out of 46 tight ends with at least 25 targets this season, and he barely made that threshold with 30 targets. So it's not like he's got a lot of evidence that that's kind of the player that he is, but I do think he's talented. That kind of put him in the mix with guys like Zach Ertz with 8.1 yards per target. He was just ahead of Charles Clay and Delaney Walker, 7.8 yards per target. So it's a small sample, but... um, on that sample, he performed like a really nice tight end one. And I could see that happening going forward. Maybe not next year, but within a couple of years, I could see him getting a pretty heavy dose of the team's targets. A lot of potential talent on the Rams team. It'll be interesting to see what they do over the course of the offseason. But I think that is going to probably do it for this episode of the Dynasty Slant. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Now that we've entered sort of the Dynasty offseason, I think Michael and I's plan is to do this podcast every other week. So you can look for us kind of kind of coming in between the championship games and the Super Bowls probably um, in the future. But if you just subscribe to the to the fantasy pet, fantasy specialty podcast at PFF, that'll be easy, the easiest way to follow um, and, and pick up all of our shows and all of the IDP and DFS shows as well, which are also really interesting. But that'll do it for this show. Thanks so much for listening, and we will look forward to talking to everybody in a couple of weeks.